Hello, and welcome to part one of... Well, I haven't recorded the other parts yet, so I'm not quite sure how many, but I'm sure I will leave a clue in the title. On the town class. Long patrol on the town class. Now, why did I do a long patrol rather than an introduction? Because if I'd done an introduction, I would have given the, some of the game away for the live. And also because I thought a long patrol would be rather fun. Now, first things first. If at any point I cough, do not worry. When I was younger, I was, or when I was a kid, I was very ill with whooping cough. And it means when I get tired, I have an extra clue that I have decided to wear my body out and I need a break. In that I don't just go from tired to falling down. I go from tired to tired with a little cough, then falling down. It's fun. So, don't worry if that happens. Right. So, town class cruisers. Town class cruisers. Why are they special? Well, I would argue that the World War II period sees a lot of wartime builds of cruisers. But a wartime built cruiser is not necessarily the epitome of what a cruiser is, because a cruiser in wartime tends to be built for the purely for the fighting role of a cruiser. And that matters. That does have critical bearing. But it means it's not as cruiser as it could be. In fact, in many ways, it becomes large escort slash small battleship. Far more than a cruiser. That's always a difficult thing to sort of point out. So what is a cruiser? If I'm going to be start talking about a cruiser and then being the most cruiser a cruiser could be, I need to explain what a cruiser is. And the live was the Thursday, the 3rd of December, if you want to go hunting for it, but there should be a link to it now in the description. The Cruiser Age. Now, I would argue and would agree the navy, uh, the Royal Navy would actually agree with this, that the cruiser age is roughly most like, uh, as we would understand it, cruisers we would understand it rather than cruisers which were sailing frigates or large razes on a uh, nice a jaunt. Was about, I would argue, 1880 to about 1950. I would argue that it's about 70 years. The naval warfare is far more about cruisers than it is about battleships. In fact, for much of this period, cruisers are often bigger than battleships. That's probably scary to think about. The idea that you build a ship which is bigger than a battleship, but is not a battleship. It's a battle cruiser. But the trouble is, when you call a, a cruiser a battle cruiser, people start to think it can do the role of a battleship because it's got battle in its title. That's silly because it can't. It's a cruiser. Really should just be called a large armored cruiser or, I don't know, just an ultra large cruiser or a very heavy cruiser or a first rate cruiser or whatever. There are so many different options, but it's a cruiser. And according to the Royal Navy, when they were considering their cruiser design in 1931 to 35, at TNA Admiralty Archives uh, 1 127412, they said that 1888 to 1902, it was constructors' materialism, i.e., it was different constructors competing, which often decided what the Royal Navy got. They were all offering these competing designs and the Royal Navy would pick from them. Naval materialism, 1902 to 1914. Basically, we often talk about the naval race as a contest between crews, uh, between battleships, i.e. who's building the most dreadnoughts, who's building the most this, the most that. These big heavy ships. But actually, there's a huge cruiser race going on as well, and 
that can be obscured a little bit by the battle cruiser portion of the Dreadnought race, but uh, it's there. And it's big. And then 1914 to 1921, naval requirements, i.e. what does the Navy actually need to do? What do they actually need to do? What they actually need to do? And then 1921 to present, the, uh, in this is in 1935, political requirements. Police note, in the Royal Navy's own, for own document, they put that question mark at the end of naval requirements. And if you look at what gets built, well, political requirements versus naval requirements are an interesting tabulation of discussion. So what is a cruiser? What is a cruiser? Lord Hill Norton is who I go to on this, rather like I go to... Uh, Every time I miss it, I cannot find his book. Casper John, for my definition of an aircraft carrier. I go to Lord Hill Norton for my definition of a cruiser. I go to Philip Vian for my definition of a destroyer, but we'll do that another day. The designation cruiser indicates her principal task, which has always been long range patrolling. And from this requirement flows her chief attribute of endurance. A cruiser must also be large enough to keep the sea in any weather, fast enough to be the eyes of the fleet, to scout into shadow, to overhaul the enemy in a chase, and are powerful enough to overwhelm that enemy with her guns, though not so to slog it out in the line of battle against heavily armed ships. There is a distinction there. A running battle, a battle of manoeuvre, that is what a cruiser is built for, not a battle of attrition, not in a long run, not so much an artillery duel as a sniper duel. <clears throat> a maritime island nation like Britain, with vital, worldwide interests, has always been peculiarly vulnerable to the guerre de course, the attack on her merchant shipping on which her life depends. Yeah, the course is a common phraseology. It, it doesn't even it even predates the June de la Col. Um it's been around a long time. The idea is you can make war by just attacking trade. And frigates are used to that in the eighteenth and early nineteenth century. It's what they're there for. But again, Britain's been doing it all its history, its naval history. That's how Hawkins, Drake, Raleigh, all made their names. Gear de course. Commerce warfare. Thus, the cruiser became commerce destroyers as well as commerce defenders, the weapon of both the weaker naval power and the stronger. In the Royal Navy, the cruiser has to fulfil both functions, performing her traditional task of protecting the country's merchant marine from interference and at the same time denying the use of the sea you know, to the shipping of the en her enemies. To Bromley land power cruiser warfare was a useful secondary form of offensive. To maritime power, it is often and of necessity defensive. Cruiser warfare, get a course, is both ways. It is neither offensive, neither defensive. It is both. You have good defense of your trade routes. You'll, by necessar necessity, because of your presence on the trade routes, probably stop your enemy being able to carry out their trade. So you'll have, be able to use the sea. And... That is the end of what a cruiser is about. It's about guaranteeing use of the sea in peacetime and in war. In peacetime, it does it by presence, diplomacy, and image. In wartime, it does it by finding the enemy and taking them out. Now, there's an interesting point which was raised in the discussion, which was, oh, were they replaced in the reconnaissance role by aircraft? Now, often they ended up with aircraft on them, the cruisers, 
and those did certainly add to the reconnaissance role, but there's keeping to the sea in all weathers. <clears throat> this time, where aircraft were certainly not all weather capable in the 1920s and 1930s, they weren't yet there. They wouldn't even really be there the whole way through World War II. It's all weather, we consider night a form of weather, storms, very high, uh, you know, high pressure, high weather systems. All these things can affect the operation of aircraft. So they're very good, but your cruise is going to keep up. They're going to keep down all weather. As such, aircraft aren't universally replacing crews at this time. There's also the fact that a cruiser will often be operating in places of the world where there might not be an aircraft carrier present. There might not be support present. So, with the aircraft versus cruiser debate, it's not so much a replacement. It's not an either or. They usually work better together. The thing is, your aircraft provides you with long range, wide area search. That can be repeated to cover that wide area. A vessel, especially the size of a cruiser, which can maintain its presence in all weathers, provides you with persistent monitoring of an area, persistent visible presence within that area. You can't build a wall in the sea. I know China's currently trying, but you can't. No matter how many islands you build. So everything, your all your control and sea is, and your, all your presence is transitory. Ship and aircraft together. That's a strong presence. That's what you'd ideally want if you're doing a maritime security to Falkland Islands. You'd want about four MP8, uh, four MP8s on maritime patrol. You'd want some UAVs to back them up. You would want some fighters based on the islands for air defence to protect those P8s and to provide some extra air defence for the OPVs and the surface escort, which will hopefully be operating from that. OPVs in the stretch to include naval ones, but also maritime security vessels such as fishery protection ships. Maritime security, presence, diplomacy, all these things come together in a cruiser in peacetime and in wartime. Wartime actually makes it easier because you know who you can shoot and who you can't. Peacetime, you have to try and deter everyone with presence and diplomacy. Preferable not to start shooting. Hints the start of war, and then politicians don't like that. No one really likes that. So, this is what the Royal Navy was worrying about defending. This is the trade, according to the Royal Navy, in the 1930s. And I know I've covered this many, many times before. But every time I do one of these videos, it's always worthwhile mentioning. Looking at those thick lines of trade, looking at where they go. And you have to remember, this map is both a map of the, what the Royal Navy has to protect and what the Royal Navy has to interdict. Because you can also see the principal trade routes of Japan, because there are British merchant, there are British and Commonwealth ships on it. You can see the principal trade routes of America, because there are British and Commonwealth ships on it. You can see the principal trade routes of Italy, because there are British and Commonwealth ships on it. So, whoever could be a potential threat, and I, I know I brought up America there, but there's also Germany and all the others on there. The thing is, whoever you end up with. So, in the 1920s, people like to talk about there being a threat of war between Britain and America. Incredibly unlikely. I really can't downplay it enough. 
But the thing is, Britain knew what it would go for. It goes for the Achilles heel of any nation in a global trading environment. The trade routes. It's not just Britain's Achilles heel, it's everyone's Achilles heel. Traditionally in World War II we, and World War I, we talk about the threat to British trade. And there's also the blockade of Germany. And frankly, if they hadn't managed to get hold of Norway, the lack of iron ore would have been especially difficult. In case of war with Japan, of course, they needed a lot of cruisers, and they had plans for where they were based on. As you can see, you need some cruisers out quite far on the sort of the Gilbert Islands and at Rabul to cover a large section Pacific, of the Pacific. Why? Because the RN's looking at these trade routes going across the Pacific on the right of the screen. And as you can see, Esquimalt is also getting some as well. So, you know, the RN's going to be well positioned to take out those trade routes, and that's what they want to do. They've also got a hefty number of cruisers based as a second line behind those based at Hong Kong. Now, the odds are those based at Hong Kong wouldn't be based at Hong Kong for long. They'd move up to way high away. And you could well find that some of the cruisers from Trim Comely and possibly some of the ones from Australia would get moved north to Hong Kong. But, you know, that's a whole different scenario to talk about. Again, the trade routes. That is what the RN is building its cruisers for, those trade routes. You can see the dogleg of the RN from the Mediterranean. Now, why haven't I continued to blue onto the Indian Ocean? Well, again, if we go back, the RN's plan in war with... Japan is to block Japan off from the Indian Ocean. Their plan for war with Germany is to block Germany off from the world. Their plan with war with Italy is to, well, block that off in the Mediterranean and have all the trade go round Africa. That's another reason why this, this is so focused on the larger merchant vessels and how many of them there are in the world, because to move the trade from going through the Mediterranean to around Africa requires larger ships. Better sea keeping. Make the trips more viable. The real question is, the RN's building on this and looking at this, it's got all these preparations, why is it not prepared for World War II? Well, it is prepared to the extent it can be. With treaties and all these limits, it is building as many cruisers as it can. It's built tribal class destroyers. It's tried to build as many presence, trade protection, and trade interdiction ships as it can. But there is a difference between fighting a war versus one power and fighting a war versus two powers and fighting a war versus three powers, all of whom are in different theatres. Okay, One of the interesting things in World War II is you often hear things described as being the European theatre of war. Well, that might be true if you're an air force or if you're an army. I doubt it so much in the case of army, but if you're a navy, you've got the North Atlantic, the North Sea, the English Channel, the Mediterranean, with its ascendant Adriatic, and you've got the Mid-Atlantic as well, and the South Atlantic, all included. Oh, and the Grass Bay even gets in the Indian Ocean. So, yes, you have a European theatre, but your navy needs to be all over there. When Japan enters the war, you suddenly have to be in the Pacific as well. And you can't afford to concentrate anywhere. Because if you concentrate, let's say you concentrate all your fleet at home to protect the UK. That's perfectly reasonable. Logical. Defending the home islands. You're abandoning the whole of the empire. All the Commonwealth nations, Australia, all those people that have shed blood by you, by you in many wars. 
you have abandoned them. You've abandoned India. You've abandoned all the places you're drawing supplies from to fight the war. Okay. All right. You see, that's fine. Let's okay. Let we can't abandon the Far East. Okay, so we need a fleet out there. We need a fleet at home. Let's abandon Mediterranean. Ouch! If you abandon the Mediterranean, then what's going to stop the Germans and the Italians managing to march on the Gulf and getting to oil and fuel supplies? Fuel supplies you're using to support your forces in the Far East. Remember, most of the fuel coming for the UK was coming across from Canada and America, coming across the Atlantic. Most of the fuel in the Gulf was actually being used to support the forces in the Far East and in North Africa. So, what number would have been the right number of cruisers for the war that Britain faced? That's not a nice figure to work out. Britain had walked out, worked out for a war with, with Japan, it needed 72 cruisers. For a war like it faced... Honestly, it could have done with 96. With that extra 24 being half our fuses and half towns. And there's a reason I picked those two classes. Town classes, Zeus will fit, but they're the long range ones. And they will be getting more into them in part two. We'll go through that design. But why more our fuses? Because if you have enough Ara fusers, you can remove all other light cruiser types from the Mediterranean. And because they will take on most Italian light cruisers will be putty in the hands of an Ara fuser class. Their heavy cruisers are a problem, so you'll need to maintain some counties there, but the light cruisers less so. And that frees up your town class that you do have elsewhere to go elsewhere. Also like to have upgraded all the C's and D's. But, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Four point five inch guns on all the destroyers. All would be nice ideas, but that didn't happen. So you went and you had planned along the money and the politics allowance to get the best ships you could to fit the naval requirements. As the trouble is, the war that happened was the worst case scenario for anyone. No one really thought there was going to be another world war. They thought they'd be dealing with Japan or Germany. There was always a suspicion that Mussolini might get involved, but there was also a large idea that he might not, because he liked to play the big man on the world stage, he liked to play the peacemaker, so there was always a possibility that he could just decide not to that day. So... Part two will be the town class as constructed in peace. And I hope you enjoyed part one. Cruisers are something which are fundamental to understanding 1880 to 1950. <coughs> they are critical when it's considering how naval power and how presence and how global power is constructed and is exercised. You have to, when you're thinking about a cruiser, you have to think about something which is a tool for diplomacy as much as it is a tool for war. It has to be as familiar working with ambassadors as it is admirals. 
and is useful to both. Often is not. Hope that helped, and hope you'll join me for the next part. Thank you.